yes, oh yes, oh yes. All persons who have business to be heard before the court leet and court baron of the manor of Bromsgrove, draw nigh and give your attention. Or you may be amherst. God save the Queen and the Lord of the Manor. Thank you, Kevin. Through such a proclamation of the people of Bromsgrove being summoned to attend court since 1199, and at 821 years of age, ours could be the oldest surviving such court in the whole country. So you might expect my story to start with this man, King John. However, those King John that granted us the charter, the court did not simply pop into existence. Its origins go back much further than him. Bromsgrove has been recognized as an important town for well over a thousand years. And in 804, it was held by Ethelric, a Wiccan elderman. Here already is a reference to one of our court officers. But as an elderman, Ethelric was no mere servant of the court. In Anglo-Saxon times, an elderman was often responsible for governing huge areas of territory, often ruling as might a king. And so it's in Anglo-Saxon times that we begin our story. We've been led to believe that Alfred, whilst licking his wounds at his retreat in the Somerset marshes, cogitated on how he might rid himself of some pesky Europeans. Looks a bit familiar to me. Anyway, in so doing, he took his eye off the stove and burnt the griddle cakes, incurring the wrath of her indoors. We're further told that as part of his strategy to hit back at the Vikings, the heathen hordes, he also devised an administrative framework, the shires, with their divisions and subdivisions, that would provide the social, political, legal and military structure to bring order to his realm. But as with the cakes, this was just part of his legend because within Alfred's kingdom, Wessex, the kingdom of the West Saxons, there were four counties in existence at least a century before Alfred's reign, Somerset, Dorset, Wiltshire and Hampshire. But the Eastern kingdoms of Surrey, Kent, and Sussex, Sussex being the territory of the South Saxons, were only brought under Wessex rule later. We certainly can't give Alfred credit for creating our own Midland shires, as the shiring of Mercia didn't happen until the following century. If we're to give credit to anyone here in Worcestershire, maybe we should recognize Athelflaed. As I've said, in Alfred's time, Mercia was not divided into counties, but into smaller population groups where eldermen appeared to emerge rather than be appointed by the king. One of the most powerful of these eldermen was Ethelred, who came to rule over the western part of Mercia. Alfred came to trust Ethelred and together they pushed back the heathen hordes. I say together, but Alfred actually rarely stayed straight out of Wessex. So Athelred, by, by and large, fought his own battles. And following Athelred's success and to further cement their partnership, Alfred arranged for him to marry his eldest daughter, Athelflaed. And together, Athelred and Athelflaed oversaw the Mercian response to the Danish threat, repeatedly fighting back against their incursions into Mercian territory and building or rebuilding burrs to provide the strategic military bases for their fight back. Their first burr, most importantly for us, was at Worcester. This is the charter that was signed um, when the burr at Worcester was created. And there are a few things to note. First of all, if we look, we see that both Ethelred and Athelfled are referred to rather than Athelred solely, indicating even at this early stage, when Athelfled may only have been about 20 years old, that she was held in the highest regard. Secondly, 
that their charter was approved by the Mercian Witten, a court that brought together the king's representatives and leaders of the church to consider and advise on the most important affairs. As an aside, we know that Alfred attended such a Witten at Droitwich on one of his rare trips north. And there are those that think he may have ventured as far as Bromsgrove. Anyway, thirdly, the references to some of the misdemeanors and particularly the dishonest trading points to there being officers paid to, re to expose those rogue traders. Maybe the ale tasters, bread wares and carnitors that are still such important members of our own court. Now, the size of each of these burrs was hugely significant. In the case of Worcester shown here, the length of the perimeter walls were measured at over 1500 yards <clears throat> and the number of soldiers required to defend those walls was calculated on the basis of four soldiers for five and a half yards. That's approximately 1100 soldiers in total. Each soldier would have been granted one hide of land to support themselves. Although William Ledbetter's 1946 book, Story of Bromsgrove, suggests a hide to have been around 100 to 120 acres, he was probably referring to the Norman measurement. The Saxon hide was actually likely to have been the equivalent of about 30 acres, but whichever, it is suggested that these measurements and the number of the hides that were generated were used to determine the size of the resulting county of Worcestershire. And following Worcester came Gloucester, Athelred and Athelred's capital, and the site of their later burial. And then Hereford, Stafford, Shrewsbury, Chester and Warwick, amongst others. And if you note, all of these became county towns. And that's possible that some of these Mercian counties were formed before Athelfled's death in 918. It was more likely to have been later, by mid 10th century. Anyway, back to the birds. Our own William Ledbetter stated unequivocally that Athelfled also constructed a burr here in Bromsgrove, probably on the current site of St John's Church. Although this has to be doubted. It's certainly true that a burr was constructed in 910 at a place called Bremsbrig, but um, it appears unlikely that the name would have changed from Bromsgraf in 804 or Wood to Brems Brig in 910, and, um, and that meaning fort, and then always back again to Brums Grave in 1086. And would they have felt that another fort was necessary so close to Worcester? There was also the problem of water. Forts at this time tended to be built close to a major water course. And it's unlikely that the Spadesbourne would have been deemed such. On the other hand, St John's Hill might have appeared an ideal vantage point, and Bromsgrove's position on an old Roman road and at the intersection of so many important routes would have provided opportunities for mounted Mercian troops to move quickly to and from other strongholds. There's also the theory that the Great Battle of Tettenhall, a bloody defeat of the Danes at the hands of a combined Saxon and Mercian army, thought by many historians to have been the Tettenhall near Wensfield, was in fact fought here in Bromsgrove at Tuttenhall, and wait to this argument being that Tuttenhall was once known as Tuttenhall. Despite the similarities, the truth is, without archaeology coming to the rescue, we're unlikely to ever know for sure. And it's equally possible that Bromsbrig could have been Bromsborough or Bromsborough. Ethelred died in 911, but rather than seeking another alderman to take on the battle against the Vikings, Athelfled's brother Edward, who had 10 years earlier succeeded his father Alfred as King of Wessex, was confident enough to leave this hugely important task to his sister. And she continued this fight alone for the next seven years, proving to be a fearsome leader. Her success in defeating the Danes in Mercia at least matched that of Alfred down in Wessex. Admittedly, Alfred had enjoyed a terrific victory when he fought his way out of his Somerset exile. And he had to deal with those Vikings coming ashore on his southern coastline. But consider the length of the front line between Mercia and the Danelaw. 
Plus, she had to deal with a frequently hostile neighbour in the West, the Welsh. And she also had her own maritime vulnerabilities. Small though it was, her coastline on the Wirral was exposed and indeed was for a time ceded to Vikings crossing from Ireland. But despite her heroics, it's Alfred that throughout subsequent history gets all the credit. Because like most historical figures that enjoy success, they also have successful propaganda machines. For Wessex and King Alfred, there were the Anglo-Saxon Saxon Chronicles, and for Ethelred, the Mercian Register. Athelfled gets barely a mention in the Wessex Chronicles, but her marriage to and her exploits with Athelred are well documented in the register. As we said, after her brother Edward became king, he was happy for Athelred fled to rule Mercia. But when she died, Edward spirited away Athelfled's only daughter and successor, Alfwyn, and Edward was then accepted as King of Mercia. And so, rather than the Mercian register, it was the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles, the mouthpiece of the West Saxons that dominated later historical commentaries. And Athelfled's heroics were unfortunately consigned to the historical dustbin. The epithet great was a Victorian invention. Here we see Alfred inciting the Saxons to prevent the landing of the Danes by George Frederick Watts in 1846. And it's displayed in the Houses of Parliament. And we can see clearly the highly romanticized depiction of the slender, handsome king with his billowing cloak and out for a sword. However, recent historians have begun to rummage in that historical dustbin and we're now seeing 21st century romantic interpretation of Athelflaed, as fans of Bernard Cornwall's Last Kingdom might testify. But I would suggest that Tim Clarkson's book, Athelflaed, The Lady of the Mercians, is a more considered account of her life, and um, I would definitely commend that to you. Let's not be too partisan, though. Alfred was a popular king, seen to be fair and just, and in the end, militarily successful. His legacy was that he was the one that gave him the credit for many of the administrative advancements of the Anglo-Saxons. You know what? He was actually a bit of a reactionary. Um, so all that he was said to have done in the, you know, um, building up the counties and so on, he actually avoided making changes, even when he knew there were flaws in the system in case by making such changes, he compromised the overall success of the system. What he did appear to do, however, was ensure that the Anglo-Saxon administration systems were applied with fastidious care. So, we have a system of government introduced by the Angles and the Saxons when they inverted, invaded, invaded Britain and refined by Alfred. We have peace in our region, Mercia, it having been cleared of the Danes by Athelflaed, and we have stability provided by the subsequent unification of Mercia and Wessex. And so when we arrive at the mid 900s, the county of Worcestershire finally established, we can now focus on those administrative systems that would lead to the establishment of Bromsgrove Court Lead 250 years later. We mentioned earlier that the smallest land area was that of a hide, an area that could provide for a single freeholder and his family. Ten hides together were known as a tithing. And each of these tithings had, a fruit, had um, ten freeholders and they were a pledge and security for each other. And this was known as a frank pledge. They, the freeholders between them, and, uh, appointed a spokesman, a tithingman, whose responsibility it was to bring to the attention of the authorities any misdemeanor committed in his tithing. Should he fail to do so, all the families in the tithing would be punished. And this joint responsibility was, for a time at least, so successful. There is variously said that a person could leave a gold chain hanging from the branch without fear of it being stolen, or 
a drop first could still be there a month later. And these principles have been revisited at various times since. William the Conqueror himself made the view of Frank Pledge compulsory in the tithings, with only women, clergy and richer freemen being exempt. And today, the law of joint enterprise has its echoes in this past. This metric system of 10 hides forming a tithing was continued with 10 tithings forming a hundred. And 10 hundreds forming a lath, of which early Worcestershire had two. And these structures were well established in Anglo-Saxon England by the 11th century. Now that it was unified, um, Wessex and, and Mercia, keeping it so would rely on good communication. And so these structures were vital. The king would consult his witten, attended by, amongst others, bishops and aldermen. The aldermen would attend the shire courts, from where the shire reeves would take the king's message out to the hundreds, and the hundred men would take it to the tidings. So the message got out from the king to all the subjects. The judicial functions of the Anglo-Saxon legal system were also practiced through these courts. Once a charge had been brought, it had to be heard by a court which would decide whether or not a crime had been committed, and if so, what action was necessary. The Hundred Court met every four weeks, but the Shire Court only met twice a year. Lawsuits could be passed on to the Shire Court if the Hundred Court was not able to reach a judgment. So, as we can see, the basic court structures were in place long before King John's time. And there were also royal manors before King John. And there were often, of course, lords who were granted those manors. But the concept of a lord of the manor, as we've come to understand it, wasn't so clear. And often the people placed themselves under the protection of the nobleman. In Bromsgrove in the time before the Norman Conquest, this was said to be Earl Edwin, possibly the Earl of Mercia, whose sister was married to Harold Godwinson. So when the Normans finally arrived in 1066, they inherited a well-established management system, one that would be further strengthened under the feudal system. But it was not necessarily working as well as Alfred had left it. Indeed, when Athelstan, Alfred's grandson, became the first king of all the English, he lamented upon the fact that his kingdom was so lawless that 10-year-old children were being executed for stealing sheep. So William stamped his foot and his authority. He restated the need for the people to attend court and the view of Frank Pledge. This Anglo-Saxon organization must also have made it more straightforward to administer William I's census. When the results of that doomsday census came back to William, he recognized the hunting potential of Feckenham Forest in which Bromsgrove lay. It was particularly rich in wild boar and though some historians dispute it, this could account for the symbol of the boar coming to represent the town. Whatever, William decided to retain Bromsgrove as a royal domain, and it is in this document that Bromsgrove is first referred to as the manor of Bromsgrove. There's also a mention of Bromsgrove having a reeve and a beadle. At the time of this doomsday census of 1086, another Earl Edwin was recorded as holding the Bromsgrove Manor and headed the list of the King's lands in Worcestershire. Though exactly who this Edwin was is unclear, as Edwin Earl of Mercia, previously mentioned, had been killed 15 years earlier. The Doomsday Census also identified the tithings that made up the Bromsgrove Hundred. Though we've said that there would originally have been 10 Anglo-Saxon tithings, they would not remain at that number and um, the exact number has changed considerably over the centuries. 
But at the time of Doomsday, we do know that these tidings or yields were specifically mentioned. Woodcote, Timberhonger, Fockbury, Town, and Burkett. There would, of course, have been more than these five, but as names have changed, historians are not all agreed upon the identification of all the rest. So 100 years before the Charter established the Royal Manor of Bromsgrove and Norton, most of the systems and structures were already in place, and royal manors were being created elsewhere in Norman England, and for each, a lord of the manor. One such lord was Hugh de Bardolf, or Hugh de Bard. Now, he'd been lord of the manor of Brampton in Devon, and who in Kent, so he knew the commercial benefits of lordship, but he coveted more. But then why choose Bromsgrove? It's well rehearsed that the Doomsday Book records Bromsgrove as bigger and more important than Birmingham, but this says more about Birmingham's later development than it does about Bromsgrove's preeminence. True, it was already a royal manor, it already had a church, and there's evidence that markets were held in the town. But Hugh must have recognised its potential. We've mentioned already the town's position at the hub of a road network that provided links to the biggest trade centre, trading centre, Worcester, via the salt town of, uh, of Droitwich, a town that Bromsgrove already supplied with large amounts of timber. But there was also Kidderminster, Stratford, Pershore, and yes, Birmingham too, but also by extension, Coventry, one of the biggest towns in the country at that time. And all of this set amidst some fine agricultural land. And also, as Bromsgrove was king's land, it was exempt from the jurisdiction of the sheriff and not subject to common taxation. But it would still be expensive for Hugh, with the king demanding significant payments in tallage, a tax on all towns in royal domains. Indeed, the king was demanding an increase in excess of 25% if Hugh was to take on this manor. So maybe that was why they negotiated a charter to hold a fair and markets. He would be able to extract, extract significant stealth taxes as a result. But these negotiations began not with King John, but with John's brother, Richard. Hugh was at one time viewed as a traitor to King Richard, as he was John's vassal. But he returned to Richard's favour and set out on the Third Crusade with his king. However, for some reason, he only travelled as far as Messina before turning back and returning to England. But maybe it was whilst on the outward journey that he first petitioned Richard to grant him the manor of Bromsgrove. Unfortunately for Hugh, Richard died before his petition could be granted. But fortunately for Hugh, upon the coronation of John, his original loyalty was rewarded and he was indeed given the lordship of the new manor of Bromsgrove and Norton. The Charter was issued by John, by the grace of God, King of England. Know that we have given, and by this our Charter do confirm, to Hugh de Bardolph and his heirs, the manor of Bromsgrove, with Norton and all things belonging, to have and to hold in free farm from us and our heirs, rendering annually the old farm and the incremental placed on the manor in the time of King Richard, our brother. And besides, 20 marks in cash for a new increment for all service each year. And besides, a market each week for a day, namely on Wednesday. Wherefore we wish and firmly command that the aforesaid Hugh and his heirs after him may have and hold the aforesaid manor of Bromsgrove with Norton and all things belonging, and the aforesaid market with all things belonging to free markets, well and in peace, freely and quietly, wholly, fully and honourably, in all places and things, with all liberties and free customs, belonging to the aforesaid manor and free market. So, 
In the first year of his reign, John established Bromsgrove Court and granted a charter for two fairs to be held on June the 24th, the feast day of St. John the Baptist, and October the 1st, and also for a weekly market on Wednesdays. As we have said, William the Conqueror had further strengthened the old Anglo-Saxon systems, making attendance at the court leet, or court of record as it was known, compulsory. This court would also take the view of Frank, Frank Pledge, and failure to attend would result in a fine or immersement. Cotton's lecture of 1882 tells us that the then headborough Henry Albert and his tithingman were still collecting a penny from householders so that they might be excused attendance at court. Other considerations of the court leet included those crimes punishable by civil law, whilst the court baron, i.e. the Lord of the Manor's Court, was held every three weeks, the courthouse being at Licky. As at this point, the manors of Bromsgrove and Kings Norton were still as one. Returning to Hugh, after all of his efforts, he did not live long to enjoy the benefits of his Lordship of Bromsgrove and Kings Norton, dying without heirs. Indeed, these charters didn't actually prove to be the turning point for the town. Its real growth did not begin until some, time, some years later. Had Hugh lived longer, maybe he would have realized his ambitions and Bromsgrove may then have really stolen the march on its noisy neighbor, Birmingham. Although I rather think it's better this way around. On the other hand, he may just have seen it as a cash cow. After all, his other manners, Brampton, with a population of a mere 1,260, and even, even who at 9,000 have hardly prospered. Whatever, the manor was given to William de Fernald, and in time to Queen Eleanor, wife of Edward I. As we said, being a royal domain, the manor was granted at the monarch's pleasure and likewise taken back to be given out again. So from a baron, it could be passed to another baron or to a mother, or as was the case with Edward I, to a wife. By Queen Eleanor's time, the tithing map had changed. There were now actually 15 yields, those previously high highlighted, but also Bunsford, Padston, Catshill and Shapley. Along with these six, sorry, along with these six, I've no idea which tithings are identified as Cumley, Brandley and Rant, but Tuttenhole may well be Tuttenhall. Chadwick could of course be Chaddersley, but is more likely Chadwick, although Chadwick is mentioned as a separate manor. If however it is Chadwick, then maybe and uh, anybody who can help me pronounce this, you know, I'd really appreciate it, but is that Willigwick? Anyway, it was also a separate manor. And one with a similar sounding name is mentioned in later documents, as we shall see. And Ganau was also mentioned, but again, as a separate manor. Anyway, back to our Lords. In 1332, the Lord of the Manor was Roger de Mortimer, second Earl of March. And Roger was one of many Lords who attempted to abuse his authority, in this case, by attempting to appropriate common land. However, the people of Bromsgrove and Kings Norton rose up to thwart this arrogant display of greed. But it was the bailiff that paid the ultimate price. However, more often than not, as we see with those highlighted in red, it was the Lords themselves that came to a sticky end. But back to 1461 and King Edward IV. During Edward's reign, and we only just started with our court, but already the decline has started and the power of the manorial courts began to ebb with the judicial functions of the court lead transferred to the quarter sessions of Worcestershire. 
And around this time, the tithing map changed yet again. By 1494, we'd gone down to just nine of Bromsgrove yields. Woodcote and timber hunger were together, as were Burcote and King's Cotton Hill. Given its position, we might assume King's Cotton Hill to be the Tottenham Hole mentioned earlier, and now Tuttenham. Chadwick and Willingwick were together. Is Willingwick the Wilgwick we mentioned earlier? Dodford was mentioned as a separate manor, as again was Gano and Bonehill Manor, separating it from Chadwick. Despite the erosion of the manorial court's legal powers, the royal manors themselves were still of great value, and the lordship of the manor of Bromsgrove continued to figure in royal dowries, including Henry VIII, to each of his wives. We know that at least two of them, including Anne Boleyn, attended the court baron, the great court at Licky. This great court was believed to have been held on or near the site of the Rose and Crown at Lick, when the manor extended from Grafton in the south to Norton in the north. Previously, Henry VII had sent the Bromsgrove steward, presumably Thomas Lovell, a red rose as a token of fealty and tenancy. It's thought that it was this floral tribute and royal connection that led to the name being given to the inn that stands now on or near the court site. Anyway, it was at Licky in 1564 that Elizabeth began the process of splitting the manors of Bromsgrove and Kings Norton, with the latter being granted to her favourite, Dudley. By then, the original courthouse was in a truly dilapidated condition. From the Book of Surveys within the county of Worcester, Manor of Bromsgrove, it said, there is within the said manor one house called the courthouse, wherein is kept the three weeks court for the queen, which standeth in a certain heath within the said manor called Licky Heath, whereunto there is great resort at the courts there holden, which is very ruinous. And there is within the said manor the pillory, the cooking stool and the cage, which are all very ruinous and in great decay. Though described as such in 1560, it was still standing over 50 years later, in 1624. However, no reference to it has been found since that date. So the court baron must have moved. The court lead was held in Bromsgrove, maybe here. Yeah, before that was Sainsbury's, it was the Lime Bar. But when I came to Bromsgrove, it was the Merlin, but it then changed its name to the Hundred House. Maybe this was the historic reference to a previous function? Actually, unlikely, as this was actually the Hundred House. Travelling up the Starbridge Road, this stands at the corner of Buell Head and Sandridge Lane, and it's clearly marked as such on this map of 1812. I say clearly marked, clearly it isn't. It isn't clear, but that little red pink smudge there is the hundred house and in blurred lettering there is the legend. And then this building stands opposite my house. And I remember my next door neighbor, the legendary Billy Kings telling me that this hundred house was an old coaching inn. It would certainly have been the type of hostelry that might have been used, providing a meeting space and accommodation for the important officers who may have had to travel several miles to attend court. As an aside, Bill also told me that a murder took place there some, time, some years ago, but that could be another of Bill's fantastic tales. But back to the name. Like the Merlin or Lime Bar or Sainsbury's building, I wonder, did the landlord of this hundred house steal the name from an even earlier, even more prestigious institution in order to inflate his own importance? It does happen. This pub appears to have an inflated opinion of its 
its own self? Will future historians have doubt about its provenance? It may be that each of these hundred houses has simply adopted the name without any true connection. Because we do know that some of the court's business was conducted from the original Elizabethan market house and then from the town hall shown here in the centre of the picture, built in 1832. We know, for example, that the wool scales were sited at the old market house and that it was the site of one of the pillories and that the court would begin their fair day parade from the town hall. But back to our Lords of the Manor. Of course, the days of the monarch making whimsical gestures by offering lordships to royal domains came to an end when Parliament itself became the effective Lord of the Manor following the Civil War. Prior to that, there had been a number of privileges in Bromsgrove being a royal domain. Bromsgrovians were exempt from paying tolls in any market or fair from, and from serving on juries, but this could lead to occasional disputes with the lords of neighbouring manors who attempted to disregard these privileges and to charge visiting Bromsgrovians anyway. However, there were also disputes between the court and our own Lord of the Manor. We must remember that the court was independent of the matter, manor and it was not in the gift of the Lord to appoint its officers. But John Howe, ancestor of the naval hero, Admiral Lord Howe, appears to, appears to have been a bit of a rogue and tried without success to appoint his own bailiff. He also fell foul of the court when he attempted to enclose public land. The Lordship passed to Sir Scrope Howe and freed of the royal yoke, Sir Scrope was able to dispose of the manor as he saw fit and chose to sell it in 1682 to Thomas Lord Windsor of Hule Grange, who became the Earl of Plymouth. In 1690, the Bromsgrove poll tax had the number of tithings back to 10, with Licky, sorry, Licky Common, Ganow, Willingwick and Bone Hill, all subsumed into Chadwick. Woodcote and Timberhunger were once again separate, but now Dogford was mentioned as part of Woodcote. King's Cotton Hill, or Tutnell, was now fully subsumed into Burcott. The erosion of the court's powers begun in 1461 by Edward IV and continued by Elizabeth, was reaching its nadir when John Lacey, writing in 1778, said that the town yield then containing about 400 houses was governed by a bailiff, recorder, alderman and other officers, and that as they then had no powers, a proverb had arisen, the bailiff of Bromsgrove has no fellow. Cotton, in his 1882 address, said of the bailiff, He has, however, been shorn of the larger part of his authority. His privileges have been reduced. The court over which he presides set at defiance. The ancient customs broken. And when he is in office, he is so much like his fellows that when asked what privileges the bailiff of the town possesses, we get the quaint reply, that if he finds a sow asleep in the street, he may disturb her and lie down in the place she occupied. A number of Acts of Parliament towards the end of the 19th century and the beginning of the 20th, not only effectively stripped the court of any remaining vestiges of judicial power, but also made the manorial system itself unprofitable. The Plymouths retained the manor for over 250 years, keeping it going in the early 20th century, despite there being little profit to be gained. But in 1945, the last surviving member of the family, the Dowager Lady Plymouth, sold off her remaining estate properties and was set to allow the manor to lapse into history. But as there were at least five members of the court looking forward to becoming bailiffs, 
the court persuaded to sell the title to Howard Bird, a Huell tenant, and from there it passed to his grandson, our current Lord of the Manor, Chris Bird. Chris told me recently that he'd heard a story about a canny solicitor. I can't remember whether he said that this solicitor was acting for a client or whether he was himself in trouble, but it suggested that he elected for, he elected for trial by the court leet. Whatever the outcome of the case, it was said to have brought to the government's attention the court leet's residual powers. If Chris is listening, I hope I've remembered his story correctly. True or not, the fact is that the Administration of Justice, Justice Act 1977 finally brought to an end almost 900 years of manorial courts. However, whilst the Act abolished the court leet's rights to determine legal matters, it did not abolish the court leet itself. The government granted the courts leave to appeal, providing they made their case by a certain deadline. 33 courts made their appeals and were therefore preserved following the 1977 abolition. But according to Wikipedia, there are only 22 courts still functioning. Of those granted permission to continue, Bromsgrove could be the oldest in the country. I say could be because the records for some of the courts appear to have been mislaid and, and if found might indicate an earlier inception. But my research to date suggests that there is only one older court still operating, that of Holdsworthy in Devon. But this was not one of those that submitted an appeal prior to the 1977 deadline, so actually it's got no legal status. Other local courts that did meet the deadline were Ulster, Warwick and Henley. Now, According to the court's Leeds directory and yearbook of 1999, and if anyone has a more up-to-date copy of one, I'd love to know, Henley's charter was first granted in 1220. However, Henley's website states that their first charter was granted by the Empress Matilda in 1140. Now, it's a good job I was doing some checking last night because up until last night, I hadn't, um, I hadn't mentioned the uh, 1140 um, date and I was going to claim that we were the oldest, but I suppose Henley should know its own history. So we might have to cede the title of oldest court to them. Um, but as I'm aware, Tom Mangan, who is the bailiff of Henley is listening this evening. Maybe after the meeting, we can have a bit of a, a, a Barney, Tom, and we can work out who actually is the oldest. So together with Bromsgrove, these four courts now support each other's annual events, including, of course, helping to ensure that their ale is fit, not just for their own consumption, but that of us visitors too. In allowing the courts to continue, the government recognised the importance of such traditions to the nation's heritage. <clears throat> and so they allowed the courts to execute their assizes and the nominal rights for freemen to bring presentments or complaints to the court. So we might still hear presentments for pouring slops from a window, singeing a pig in the high street, fine 10 shillings. <clears throat> keeping a disorderly house, parading a stallion by day, or leaving a cart unlit by night, fine five shillings. Now, the last part of my talk will in effect be a roll call of the current um, members of the court as they exist now, with reference back to the systems and structures that we've been discussing. But first, let's take a last look at our tithing map. And we now have these 13 tithings. Now, if you live within the Bromsgrove Court Leap boundaries, but you're unclear as to which tithing you belong to, I have spent some time identifying all the relevant uh, streets and addresses, or at least I have for all but Gano, as Gano includes a significant chunk of Rubri. Uh, I haven't been able to check 
the boundaries accurately enough. But I shall let the society have a copy of the spreadsheet and maybe if you're interested in knowing your address and where it fits in with the, uh, the tithing boundaries, we can circulate it to anyone who happens to be interested. I've also tried unsuccessfully to superimpose a Bromsgrove Council ward map over this tithing map. Um, and though it was unsuccessful, I have been able to identify, maybe unsurprisingly, that there is still some correlation between the tithings and the wards. Now, <clears throat> unless you happen to be in St. John's Church on Remembrance Sunday, or in one of the local hostries when an ale tasting is taking place, for the majority of the citizens of Bromsgrove, this might be their only experience of the court, the annual parade in a size on fair day. Certainly it's the only time that pretty much the full court can be seen publicly. But what must people make of it? As they hear the archaic proclamations, they may guess that there is some history to it all, and for some of the players in the theatre, their roles are evident. But I don't know, what does a blue gown signify, or a red or a green? And what about the funny hats? So in this last part of my presentation, I'd like to bring you up to date with those associated with Bromsgrove Court Leads in 2020, whether they be representatives of the manor or members of the court itself. And as we do, we'll build up a picture of the whole cast. Let's start with the Lord of the Manor. Though he's not strictly speaking a member of the court itself, as we discussed earlier, in Anglo-Saxon times before the manorial system was adopted, there was no Lord of the Manor, but a Lord would have taken towns under the, his protection. Our current Lord of the Manor is Chris Bird, and he, as we've heard, he inherited the title from his grandfather, Chris. Sorry, his grandfather. Chris, who is soon to celebrate his 50th year of lordship, has no formal regalia, and so on fair day, he can be identified as the one in the suit who isn't our local MP. The tithing men in their blue robes are probably the most constant members of the court system, their role remaining effectively unchanged for well over a thousand years. Introduced as we know them by the Anglo-Saxons, but you might even trace their true origins back further to when the tithes or one-tenth taxes were collected by the Romans. In Saxon times, as we said, they each represented the ten freeholders within the tithing, the tithing being an area of land that was calculated to be able to support the ten hides of the ten freeholders and their families. Each freeholder a pledge and security for the others, a frank pledge. Even today, they bring their yields list of freeholders to the spring and autumn courts and may on occasion still mischievously report on some concocted misdemeanor. They also report on any deaths that may have occurred amongst the free tenants of their tithing and where heriots or death duties might have to be paid. Next, we have the aldermen in their red gowns. In Saxon times, an alderman was of much greater importance, often with the power and authority of a minor king, ruling over large areas of territory. The name given to the role of alderman by the Anglo-Saxons had changed to Earl by Norman times as a result of Viking influence. But the name alderman survived, but with a different role. The Norman alderman was the keeper of the hundreds. This was a prestigious position and could lead to great wealth. In today's court, the aldermen are all past bailiffs. And now the reeve. The Anglo-Saxon term reeve simply meant administrator and could be prefixed with words such as village, town, shire or royal. We take this extract from the Anglo-Saxon Chronicles of 789, a full century before Alfred. And in Beatrix days came for the first time three ships of Northmen from Hawthorland. And then the Reeve rode thither and tried to compel them to go to the royal manor, for he did not know what they were. And then they slew him. 
These were the first ships of the Danes to come to England. The reeve here mentioned is clearly an important servant to the crown, but as Anglo-Saxons developed their structures, so the shire reeves became the sheriffs, responsible for the shires, a position that continued with the Normans. But these Norman sheriffs held no sway in the royal domains like Bromsgrove. As we've already seen, Bromsgrovians paid their taxes to the king. As our Norman reeve was responsible for the collection of taxes and of chief rents, an annual charge payable by freeholders to the lord of the manor, an income that no doubt Hugh de Bard coveted when he asked for the lordship. Originally the reeve was a tenant's nomination and came from within their own ranks. Appointed by most voices at the Great Autumn Court, the reeve's period in office has for some time been for just one year. And by long precedent, it is assumed that the reeve will become the bailiff the following year. However, early Norman reeves were answerable to the lord of the manor. But if they were fastidious in managing the manor, but fair in managing the tenants, they often had a job for life. While still a very important role, the status of reeve in royal domains was now that of a deputy to the bailiff the chief officer of the court, appointed at the great court and also elected by most voices. This is Arthur Chapel, bailiff in 1928. By all accounts, a fun-loving character who always wore his bailiff's Wellington hat sideways, Napoleon style. Behind him in what appears to be a sloppily worn chain of office, we can assume is the Reeve, William McCandlish, who would become bailiff the following year. Assuming events go ahead next year, we should see our town, our own Joe Slade, the first female bailiff in 821 years near the head of the June Day Parade. The term bailiff is a Norman construct, but is essentially another administrator, though one with considerable powers. As a royal domain, the bailiff was answerable to the king. Though exempt from military service himself, should the king come calling, the bailiff would be required to muster the archers and billmen. Amongst other benefits, the bailiff collected commission for the sale of wool on market days. He was responsible for providing the scales and staff to do the weighing, as this proclamation of 1777 attests. The sellers and dealers in wool are desired to observe that the town hall is reserved for their use during the fair. Scales and weights are likewise provided by the order of the bailiff of the said town. Therefore, all persons are hereby required to weigh wool according to ancient custom at such scales only as are appointed by his direction. William Shenstone, bailiff. Shops on the high street were entitled to pitch a stall in front of their premises on fair day. But the bailiff would send round officers to collect pitching pennies from each one. Citizens allowing their beasts to stray and graze on the waste that being the land at the edge of the road, but claimed by the Lord of the Manor, could have them impounded. Bromsgrove's last pound was on land now enclosed by All Saints Church. It was the bailiff's responsibility to manage the pound, but in return, he received all of the profits. So the office of bailiff could be a lucrative one, but court records show that it was not always so. Nevertheless, when times were good, there was a fight to join the court. The rule stated that to join the court, one must either be a resident or run a business employing people within the town. But in those good years, there is evidence that people of influence from outside of the manor managed to get themselves elected and made a tiny pro tidy profit, despite being obliged to entertain the court at their own expense. Past bailiff John Berman summed up the role of present bailiffs as visiting local courts, kissing babies, holding the spring court, ale tasting, fair day, patronal Sunday, bailiff's dinner, 
and Autumn Court. He went on, he will emerge a poorer man, but believe you me, and I know I speak for every bailiff that ever served, he will not have wished for a better year. Now, before moving on to the other roles, I just have to say that uh, throughout my research, I found the nomenclature and the roles of these latter three court members very difficult to pin down. I suppose it's no surprise that there should be some fluidity over a period of one and a half millennia, but it does make it difficult to understand and even harder to explain. But this is what I've extrapolated and then distilled. And I share it with you, but it was really more for my own benefit to just get my head around what these roles were. Um, to add to the confusion, in those translated court roles from 1494 to 1504, the title under bailiff wasn't applied to the reeve, but appears to have been interchangeable with the bailiff himself. Baber, who prepared the roles for publication, suggests that this could be because in even earlier roles, some of the bailiffs were referred to by name. And included Thomas, Archbishop of Canterbury, who was clearly not an elected Bromsgrove official, but a holder of a sinecure. So if they were supposed to be the bailiffs, then the ones doing the actual work were then called the under bailiffs. And I would welcome anyone coming to my aid and correcting or adding to this summary sometime after tonight's presentation. The bailiff appoints the headborough or constable. In this image, the headborough is William James. And he speaks for and represents the, the tithing men of the court. He's also responsible for the good order of everybody at the court meetings, subject to the directions of the marshal and for waiting on the bailiff. Today, the headborough is easily distinguished by his top hat and red and black gown. This is Jeff Evans, headborough from 2003 until autumn court this year, when the role was taken on by Charlie Ayres. I'm sure that they both satisfy the court requirements, that they be local men of good character who have some concern for the safety of their own persons and property. In the past, the constable would have raised the hue and cry when felons were discovered within the manor. To drunkards and vagrants, he was also able to administer his own immersements or fines, or to place them in the stocks if they couldn't pay. There were similar punishments for those playing on lawful games, and he might also stock itinerant preachers if he came upon them, treating them as no more than a rogue or vagabond. The constable would use the whipping post attached to the stocks to whip beggars if they refused to desist from troubling the good people of the town. Stocks were to be found under the old town hall in St. John Street and near the Crown Inn Cats Hill. I believe that past bailiff Bromsgrove cobbler Martin Canellan had some new stocks constructed during his year as bailiff, and I'm sure we could still make good use of them. Originally, the bailiff would appoint three jurymen, although this later increased to 12. Jurymen were not as we might think of a jury today. They didn't make the absolute decisions on the cases before the court, but were and are to this day the bailiff's wise advisers. Those joining the court as jurymen accept that one day they will become bailiff and it is from their ranks that the officers of the court would usually be drawn. Though tithingmen have been known to fulfil some roles, for example, our current deputy ale taster, Adrian Smith, is a tithingman. There is no expectation, however, that a tithingman would ever become bailiff, though in recent years there have been a number, including myself, who have swapped tithingman blue for juryman green. The marshal is elected annually and acts as master of ceremonies at all formal functions of the court lead, and in particular is responsible for marshalling and leading the parade at fair day. The marshal advises the bailiff of the court's customs and function. The Lord of the Manor's representative at court is the steward. He is appointed by the Lord of the Manor 
and acts on behalf of the Lord in all matters concerning the manor, including presiding at the spring and autumn courts. By tradition and precedent, this is deputed, deputed to the bailiff who presides and takes full control of the running of the court. However, it is the steward that reads out the presentment, the business of the court, including any heriots due to the court, heriots being effectively an inheritance, ta inheritance tax, whereby the family of a deceased tenant were expected to give up their best beast to the lord of the manor. Sometimes goods and chattels might be offered instead, as in 1502, when William Barnsley died, his sister, Elizabeth Grace, had to give up his three shilling feather bed as a heriot. On fair day, we are usually honoured to have as a guest our local MP. And as Chancellor of the Exchequer, he no doubt helped to raise Bromsgrove's profile. But he wasn't the first Chancellor to be associated with the court. One high-profile Bromsgrove Court steward was Sir Thomas Lovell, appointed Chancellor of the Exchequer in King Edward IV's Parliament in 1485. Unlike Sajid, Sir Thomas was conspicuously absent from Bromsgrove's court, considering his business in Parliament far too important. Although I suppose he did not have the benefit of a ministerial car to deliver him up the M40, of course, it didn't prevent him from collecting his sinecure, but it does suggest that Bromsgrove Court Leet and Court Baron were granted a great deal of independence. Two administrative appointments are the Keeper of the Records, effectively the court stenographer, and the archivist, the society's own John Weston. There's also a market master, although because of its cancellation this year, our most recently appointed market master, Dave Coulson, was not able to show his mastery of the market. Moving on, a theorist are responsible for assessing immersements and setting, that is setting the levels of fines. In today's court, three a theorists are appointed from within the body of the elder and are amongst the longest serving with a full understanding of the history and traditions of the court. The chaplain is always the cleric in office at St. John's Church, the patronal church of the court, but speaks for all denominations. Ethelred and Ethelflad's Worcester Charter of 890 made reference to fines for dishonest trading. So we can assume that there was a mechanism by which tradesmen could be held to account, an Anglo-Saxon version of trading standards. As I'm sure you're all aware, one of the most coveted roles of the court is that of the ale taster. Our contemporary ale tasters can twice a year be witnessed doing a pub crawl. Um, <clears throat> sorry, ex executing their duty, I should say, by visiting various licensed establishments to inquire, amongst other things, as to the cleanliness of their pipes, and then dutifully sampling their ales to ensure that they are being served at the correct temperature and have not been watered down. In earlier times, they would also visit to check that correct signage was placed outside the premises and that licensing hours were adhered to. As has ever been the case, such premises required careful scrutiny. In 1681, during the reign of Charles II, 27 victuallers were presented in, to court for breaking the assize of ale variously selling ale before putting out their signs and after bringing them in, or selling ale that was described as red and unhealthy. In a similar fashion, the carnators and fish tasters would have toured the market and local businesses to ensure the quality of the meat, fish and game, and to ensure that stock was correctly identified and correct weights were used. Bread, of course, was a staple food, and there were a great number of bakers. Romsgrove court rolls give testimony to the frequent attempts to defraud customers by providing false weights, or by adding other less savoury ingredients to the recipes. Non-conforming bakers had the bread confiscated and were fined 40 shillings. In Henry's time, such bakers were set in the pillory. 
Working in leather had long been a common trade in Bromsgrove. In 1490, three men were fined for polluting the spades born with beast skins. But in the time of Elizabeth I, the trade in leather goods became an important contributor to the town's wealth. And so was appointed a searcher and sealer of leather to ensure the quality of these goods. And in association with this, a brooklocker was also appointed. Elizabeth granted Bromsgrove a license to carry out tanning for just 16 days during Michaelmas and Lady Day. So limited because of the offensive smell. The scrutiny of the searcher and sealer of leather and the work of the brooklocker ensured that these limits were adhered to and that there was no pollution from the tanneries. As previously mentioned, the manufacture of woolen goods was also extremely important to Bromsgrove at this time, with Bromsgrove worsted cloth particularly sought after in London. As the bailiff had the duty to provide the scales to be used by traders attending Fair Day and gained financially from doing so, it might be assumed he would also have appointed the staff that would supervise the weighing. In 1686, the bailiff, Mr. Obadiah Orford's accounts show that the trade in wool provided his single biggest source of income. However, wool weighing was almost certainly a task that was only required at the appropriate market and not one that appears to have warranted a wool weigher becoming a court appointment. Now that almost completes the roll call, but there is one more. The town crier. Our current crier and bellman to the court, Kevin Ward, is the great, great, great grandson of the last town crier of Birmingham. But how far back might his lineage actually extend? Was he Egyptian? This would suggest so. It can only be supposed that this, possibly the first example of social media, would have been used everywhere to pass on the news and the rulers' directives to the majority that could not read it for themselves. So maybe our bellman represents the longest standing member of the court. Now the court today also raises modest sums for charity. It primarily serves to preserve a little bit of history. It tells of a time of devolved government when the court was the local council a mixture of democratically elected fixed term members and paid employed officials, raising its own taxes, whether panage or murridge, sockage or ullage, stullage or carriage, pickage or lastage, pontage or passage. Of a time when the court was responsible for trading standards and conducted its own assizes, when the court was responsible for its own policing through the constables and tithingmen, and when the court was a court, settling disputes, hearing presentments and issuing punishments, whether ducking or cooking, whipping or stocking, pillorying or tumbling, caging or immersing. Kevin, our bellman, can illustrate the last of these with his shout, albeit from a Birmingham court record. Kevin. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. The following were presented to the court held last and the following judgments made. John Cox of Birmingham, butcher. Presented by jury for exposing for sale bad and unwholesome meat, no ways fit for sale, immersed five guineas. William Ashley of Birmingham, coal dealer, for selling coals by false weights, immersed six shillings and sixpence. John Kiddy, presented, for setting up a stall in the highway called High Street, whereby the same is much straightened and obstructed to the common injury and nuisance to the Queen's people, having occasion to go pass and repass, immersed two shillings and sixpence. Samuel Taylor of Edgbaston, for laying down potatoes and garden stuff in Dale End, causing a common nuisance, immersed 
two shillings and sixpence. And let that be a lesson to you all. God save the Queen and the Lord of the Manor. Thank you, Kevin. Uh, I did muse um, for some time on how best to end, but decided I could do no better than Elderman John Berman again, who ended a previous talk to the society with this. I believe we live in an era where tradition is under siege, where there is a determined media effort to subvert and undermine the basic values of our society, which is why the court matters and why Bromsgrove society matters. The court leads and court baron of the manor of Bromsgrove has been at the very heart of our history and of stability, which is why we, who are privileged to serve it, so value and cherish its institution. Long may it survive. Though that concludes my talk this evening, before I hand back to Joe, and I was about to say to discover whether I'd left enough time for questions, but I've just glanced up at the clock, so I do apologise. Uh, three commercials. This isn't a full list of my references, but I was going to include a few more. But as I said earlier, with regard to Athelflaed, um, a suggestion for further reading. The second commercial. Um, as many of you will know, last year, with Joe and Julian, I visited the Hive in Worcester. And here we are. When we first looked into one of the boxes of archive court leak material that they hold for us, we're hoping once all of this nonsense is over, we'll be able to complete a full audit of their contents and even more importantly, a transcription of the court rolls. I know from my reading that the good intentions to execute these transcriptions goes back many decades. The fact that it hasn't yet happened indicates how challenging this task is, but it would be wonderful if we could now work together to see it accomplished. And finally, I feel we need to ensure that 2021 is the best of years. Of course, for all Bromsgrovians that have suffered so much this year, but also for Joe, who, as the court's first ever female bailiff, has worn a hollow crown with no court to preside over. But she has been granted an almost unprecedented second year in office, so I hope that you can all join us and support Joe in celebrating the 822nd anniversary of the court's third day charter. Bellman. Oh yes, oh yes, oh yes. On the order of the Bailiff of Bromsgrove, the citizens of the manor and all who may have interest are summoned to the Houseman statue at 11 of the clock on the 26th day of June in the year of our Lord 2021 that they may witness the proclamation of the Charter of King John and the assize of the court leet of leather, bread and ale. And the Elizabethan Studenit Market shall be held nearby and the bailiff shall walk a pleasure fair, given under the hand and seal of Joanne Slade, bailiff. God save the Queen and the Lord of the Manor. God save the Queen and the Lord of the Manor. Neil, thank you so much. That was really fantastic. It's um, I feel quite emotional um, as I sit here in my bailiff's regalia um, and you and your your Reeves regalia to think that we are. Um, the current position of all of that history behind us um, and it's just wonderful to to get a better understanding um, and thank you so much for your presentation this evening it's been uh, it's been super um, now and we are a bit um, a bit late in time but for me that was so fascinating I've enjoyed um, every every minute of it and I know you're keen to open up the floor um, to questions or to comments and you know, there are um, people here that are, have been connected with the court who may want to to make comments so 